All right. So yes, my name is uh, Lindsay Price. I am a uh, professional playwright, and I have been one for 17 years. And I am currently the resident playwright for Theater Folk. We write and publish play scripts specifically for schools and student performers. And I'm here today to talk about what it's been like to take a love for the arts that I've had ever since I was uh, a kid and apply it to a career in the arts. And there's two very significant aspects of my journey. The first of which is that uh, my career is very non-traditional. It's a very non-traditional arts career. I can't think off the top of my head of any other publisher that has a resident playwright, for example. People sometimes wrinkle their nose at non-traditional. We have preconceived notions, some of our own making, some placed upon us, that there's only one way to do things, one way to make a living, one way to have a career, one way to be successful in the arts, <coughs> one way to be a professional. When I started out as a playwright, I was in Toronto, and I had a very linear, preconceived notion of what it meant to be a professional playwright. And I got this notion based on pure observation, what I saw happening to all the playwrights around me. Get noticed, get a production, get an agent, get another production, strive for that show at one of the big kahuna theaters like Can Stage. And that, in my mind, was what it meant to be professional. And if I wasn't following that very narrow path, I wasn't professional. I was a failure. And that's really important uh, to say twice. If I wasn't following a very specific path in a very specific way, I was a failure. And the best thing I ever did was divorce myself from that mindset. To stop thinking there's only one way to do things, to embrace the non-traditional, and further, to divorce myself from the idea that failure equals bad, which I'm going to get more to in a minute. The second significant aspect of uh, my career is how I have embraced arts education. I believe very strongly in the importance of drama in a well-rounded education, in a well-rounded human being. Drama is one of the few areas that builds real-world skills, <laughs> communication, team building, um, creative thinking, creative problem solving, self-expression, self-confidence. If you are thinking about becoming a drama teacher or being involved with arts education, I, I really have to tip my hat because you are incredibly important, more than you know, more than you'll ever receive recognition for. And uh, here's something else, and just in terms of the realm of the importance of arts education, I've come to learn over 17 years, that makes me very old, ugh, uh, that theater in general, it doesn't change a lot. An adult in the 21st century who goes to a play, it's not really going to change their mind, right? The theater's not going to change their mind. It, it's not going to impact their life. And the complete opposite is true in the school. Theater does change lives at the school level. In youth, particularly at the middle school level, uh, in the classroom, being in a play can change a student's life. Seeing a character go through something that they're going through when they thought they were alone is impactful. Just gathering up the courage to get on stage and talk to other people, you know, speak in front of a, an audience, Having that courage, that's very impactful. And I have been so lucky because I have been seeing the impact 
of theater, through my plays at the school level, through arts education, in the classroom. And I have to say, I love being a part of that as an artist. So today, I'm going to outline what I did to get to this point, how I've applied, what I've learned with uh, a multitude of mistakes and missteps. Uh, I'll talk about how going down a non-traditional path and also how uh, niche markets are a really viable art option in the arts and how being open to change and particularly open to failure are key to a successful career in the arts. So how did this happen for me? How did a career in the arts and arts education happen for me? I make a living writing plays for schools, for students. That's a really amazing thing to say, right? Uh, because one of the things that, uh, one of those preconceived notions is when we think school, particularly high school, we think amateur, right? I sure did. I resisted for years writing for the school market and being involved with arts education. I did not want to write for schools. I did not want theater folk to be my full-time job. I wanted to be a playwright, you know, all caps, right? That was the only way to be important. That was the only way to have impact. But really, that's just kind of what I thought because everyone else was doing it. Everyone else was going for this, you know, all caps thing. So I kind of thought that I had to, too. Even though, as I was trying to do it, in no way was it working for me. It just wasn't working for me at all. In the arts, we're really big at looking over everybody else's fence, right? Seeing what someone else is doing seeing what some, uh, what other actor is doing, seeing what other, you know, play someone else has got going, wanting what they have. If I had his gig, if I had her opportunity, if I had that, then my career would go somewhere. Then my career would really zoom. If what you're doing in the arts isn't working, you have to take a long look at why. Is it really just a matter of time? It can be. You could be moving forward. You know, you could be on that, on the right path, and it's just step after step after step. Or are you knocking on a door that's not going to open? Are you knocking on a door that's never going to open? They don't open for everybody, right? I have... I have friends, I have a particular friend who uh, wanted a career at Second City, did all the right things, took the classes, got in the touring company, subbed in on main stage, never got the call to the show. What do you do, right? You could be the one. You could be the one that the door opens for. You could have the traditional life in the arts that you have always dreamed of. But what are you going to do if the doors don't open for you? Do you keep going or do you change? That is an incredibly hard choice to make. Keep going or change. And notice I do not say give up. You do not have to give up on a career in the arts simply because the path you want isn't exactly the path that you're on. And I have to say for myself, one of the best assets over the years that I have had is I never gave up, no matter what happened. Many things happened, which was sort of like a, you know, you should really go do something else. And I never gave up. My career is a result of both a lot of mistakes and a lot of choices, which kind of seems contradictory. But what makes a successful career is not how well you avoid mistakes. 
It's the reaction once the mistakes have been made because you cannot avoid making mistakes in your career, whatever the career. It is impossible. Human beings make mistakes. It is the thing that we are best at, you know? And unless you've got that time machine, you know, unless you've got that time machine patent in your back pocket that you're just waiting for the right moment to, you know, swing out, unless you've got that, nobody knows what the future holds until it actually gets here. What if you think you want to be a teacher? You're sure you want to be a teacher. It is the thing that drives you. You, you want, it's the right move until you get in the classroom and you realize that oh, you, you don't like teaching. What do you do? Or you love teaching, but all the red tape that comes outside of the classroom drives you nuts. What do you do? What if you're sitting here and you want to be an actor? It's what drives you. It is what you are sure you are good at and you want to do. What if you never get the right roles? What if you can't stand the, the schmoozing that is a necessary part of being an actor? Right? Well, what if you don't want to spend four years to do commercials? What do you do? Right? It's the choices you make out of a situation that matter. Do you keep going or do you change? And you also, along with uh, um, humans being, beings being really great at making mistakes, we're also really great at failing. You cannot avoid failure. It is impossible. And it would be better and much less stressful if you just embraced it. If you looked at failure as an event in your life and not your life. Now, school teaches us the exact opposite of that. School is not real big on failure, right? School teaches us that there is a right and a wrong, and it is better if you get more right answers, because if you get more right answers, you do well on the test, and life is wonderful. If you fail a test, you're failing at life. That's what school kind of embeds at us since we're five years old. When the truth of the matter is, the, really the only way to get better at life is to fail a lot, right? You fall off the horse, get back on. You fall off the horse, you redesign the saddle. You fall off the horse, you buy a bike. <laughs> it is only failure if you don't learn anything from it. So some uh, famous failures, just to sort of ex make example of this. Uh, Michael Jordan, he was uh, cut from his high school basketball team. Walt Disney declared bankruptcy at 22, not that much older than you are now, bankrupt. Abraham Lincoln lost political seats eight times before being elected president. He tried eight times. Uh, both John Grisham and J.K. Rowling were rejected by 12 publishers. Salvador Dali was expelled from art school. Right? So, I'm very happy to say I've made a lot of mistakes and I've failed a lot in my life. I don't have a theater degree. I have an English degree with a theater minor from Wilfrid Laurier University. And uh, by far, the biggest mistake I ever made in my life was to go into English. And second to that, I had an opportunity to get out. I knew in second year. I knew it was the bad, the, the, the bad mistake. I knew I should leave. And I stayed. <laughs> and in fourth year, I uh, hated every millisecond of every class. I was barely passing. I dropped from an honors to a general. And what was I doing? What I should have been doing in second year. I was spending all my time doing theater. Right? And after university, my, my initial plan was that I was going to go become an actor. And I thought that if I didn't act, that I would die, which apparently doesn't happen to people. <laughs> uh, but 
I didn't like the roles I was getting. I was never an ingenue. I'm nev never. Uh, and I got into writing because I didn't like I didn't like the parts I was getting, and I thought, well, I'm just going to go write my own. You know, snaps to that. <laughs> Apply writing was a complete accident. Uh, I saw it as a means to something else. It was a door I could open, and I started uh, touring the Fringe Festival circuit. Uh, I toured Canada uh, for six years, writing plays, being in them, uh, and just really learning. Because I think that the fringe circuit, and I don't mean just doing one, you know, just doing one like a little summer project. I mean touring, like in a car from Montreal to Vancouver, you know, spending months at a time doing show after show after show. I just think it is the most fantastic training ground for actors, directors, writers, even teachers, even if you're destined for the classroom. What a wonderful thing to be able to uh, pass on that from a place of experience to students. It was just an excellent teacher for me to be on the fringe for that long. My craft as a playwright was honed, uh, not in a classroom, but by practice and by production. A lot of trial by fire, more failure. Uh, I had one show for some reason, and I, to this day I do not know why I chose to write about this, because uh, I, it, <laughs> uh, I'm not a religious person, but I wrote a play about the Bible because I thought it was it was interesting. I'm a, I'm a total layman. And I wrote a number of characters and how they interacted. It was, it was okay. It was one of my first plays. It was, it's, it's all right. It's now in a drawer, at the bottom of a drawer. Uh, and frankly, and nobody wanted to see this play, right? Uh, and we sold it completely wrong. Uh, there was one night in Montreal where we performed to three volunteers, not one paying customer. And I think it was at midnight. It was, it, I, by far, it was one, it was up, right up there with one of my most depressing performance, uh, uh, adventures. But, what the fringe gave me was a, a great sense of figuring out how to read an audience, what they might like to see, and also writing within limitations, which has served me really well in the school market. Uh, and I've never been bothered by limitations. People ask me all the time, you know, well, aren't you, don't you find it very limiting to write for teenagers? And I'm like, no. I like it. It makes me creative. It makes me creative to, to fight to find the right play. It makes me work harder. And I like that. I like being creative within limits. The most uh, significant choice of my entire career happened in uh, the year 2000. In the year 2000, I really thought that I was on the cusp of breaking out into that typical, traditional, shiny playwrights career. I was a member of Factory Theater's Playwrights Group. I had the dramaturg at the time from Can Stage writing, uh, reading and responding to my plays. I was writing for television. I was writing on a medical talk show. And on paper, it was a really, really exciting time. And I fully expected that Factory would take my play, and they would put it on, and it would sell out, and I'd be moved up to the Royal Alex, and everyone would love it, and then I would get another commission, and I would get a better television show, and then, zoom, it would go off. And none of that happened. Not a single thing. It was, uh, to date, the worst year of my life, creatively, artistically. Factory told me they didn't produce plays like mine, which, considering that their mandate is Canadian plays, is kind of a way of saying, we don't like you, we don't like your plays, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Uh, the dramaturg from Can Stage stopped calling. Nobody wanted, I could not get another theater to read my work. Uh, the television show was like working in a sweatshop factory. It's horrible. Uh, the bottom fell out of every single thing I was doing. I was 30 years old. I had nothing. So, keep going or change. And at that point, I had to make a choice. And the first thing I did was ask myself this question. What do I want? What do I want as a playwright? 
It is a very simple, straightforward question, and I had never asked myself this question because I was too busy, you know, following the rabbit down the hole, following what everyone else was doing, trying to do anything else but exactly what I wanted. So what do you want? Ask yourself what you want. And don't lie, and don't give an answer because someone else around you is saying something, right? What do you want as an actor? What do you want as a teacher? What do you want as an artist? What is your purpose as an artist? Knowing what you want makes it a lot easier to pursue. Easier to come up with strategies, action. Nothing feels better than when you are taking action with your career. And you need to re-ask this question all the time. What do I want? Do I, do I want the same thing? Has the answer changed? Because hopefully you're going to change as a human being, right? Hopefully you're not going to, you know, stay in crystal. You're going you're gonna to evolve. So this, the answer to this question is going to change. So my answer, what do I want? I wanted three things when I got right down to it. I wanted to make a living as a playwright. I wanted to write good plays. And I wanted to have some impact as an artist. Every single one of those things was doable writing for schools. Every single one of those things was doable with theater folk. The very thing that I had been resisting like a screaming two-year-old not to do. And the instant... The second I changed my focus from this very narrow traditional path from traditional to theater folk, everything fell into place. And it wasn't overnight. It took a long time. It took a time to build up the catalog. It took time to build up the audience. It took time to write the plays. But I was taking steps and I was moving forward, which I had never been able to do before. I had strategy, I had action, I had purpose, and having a specific focus made all the difference. So, theater folk has also had a very uh, interesting journey uh, making choices out of situations. We started out as a production company. We wrote and toured children's plays during the school year, and then we toured the Fringe in the summer. And we did that for five years, and after five years of basically spinning our wheels, not moving forward in any way as a company, getting totally burned out, we had to make a choice with this company. Keep going or change. We thought we wanted to be producers, but it turns out we were really bad at it. We weren't into it 100%. What is your percentage in your art? Are you in your art 100%? Is it more? Are you one of those 110 percenters? Is it less? We were less. So we had to take action to make a choice. So without the production angle, we had a bunch of scripts, original scripts running around. And very naively, we just went, well, why don't we publish them? It was a risk, and it certainly could have failed, but we didn't stop. Theater folk transitioned from a production company to being a publisher. We started out as a self-publisher because the only author was me. But then we started accepting outside writers. And the number of our plays in our catalog started to grow. And we moved up to becoming independent publishers. We started attending conferences. We we'll go to Code here in Canada and many, many more in the States. This year, we sent out 30,000 catalogs, and we're, which has changed quite a bit, too. When we started out, we went from this to this to that. That's our latest change. So at Theater Folk, we like taking risks. We strive to take risks, to take on risky projects. Bless you. That was a beautiful little snuff, uh, sneeze cough. All right. Uh, so we're taking on risky projects. 
and we actually do call them, we call them fail projects. Not because we expect them to fail, not because we expect them to do badly, because we don't believe that fail equals bad. We know how important it is to take on projects that aren't safe. And that is something that all artists must do. If you want to grow as an artist, if you want to change as an artist, if you want to survive as an artist, you need risk projects. Otherwise, you're just going in circles, right? It's a hamster on a wheel. It's all safe. It's all beige. Why on earth would you want to make beige art? So what risks are you taking in your art? And you know I don't mean skydiving. Right? Taking on something that might fail. For us, a fail project isn't doomed, it is wonderfully unsafe. It's an adventure rather than something depressing or hopeless, and, and not all these projects work out. We've had some very spectacular failures. Uh, we go to a number of uh, conferences, theater conferences for schools and student performers, and at each conference we try a new selling technique. You know, trying new ways to bring customers to the table, to take away our catalog. At uh, one conference, we tried to sell uh, scripts on a USB rather than a hard copy. Uh, nobody liked that. Uh, one year, we didn't do a catalog. Nobody liked that either. Uh, we've tried venturing into textbooks, especially for elementary students, which made us realize that we don't want to be in elementary schools. We, we like middle school and high school. Now, of course, that's just ones that didn't work. We've also risked and succeeded. Our sales tactics this year is giving away stuff for free. We have a CD-ROM that has sample pages from every single one of our plays that we're giving away when we go to conferences. We're one of the only publishing companies that offers PDF copies of our scripts and photocopy licenses for productions and performances. We've started doing e-books. We do resource guides. We have one on inspiring students to write through picture prompts, on how to write a vignette play with a class, and our latest one, which is very, very popular, it's awesome, uh, if I do say so, uh, emergency lesson plans for drama teachers. Every single one of our failed projects, the ones that didn't work out and the ones that did, all of them uh, make us a better company. Uh, they make us, they allow us to have sort of instant market research results, and we can talk about the results, and we can make active decisions based on those results, keep going or change. I'm definitely not where I thought I would be at the beginning of my career, but really there's no place that I would rather be. This is a very tough market right now, in whatever job you're going to go into, right? There is no guarantee. A university degree will not guarantee you a job. That's over. You get one acting job, there is no guarantee for a second or a third, right? There is no guarantees. So what it all boils down to is you better love what you do because you're going to have to work hard at it. So why not work hard doing something that you love rather than something that just pays bills or gets you by? I get to make a living as a playwright. I have the opportunity to impact with my writing. I have control over my writing. And it's hard work, but it doesn't feel like hard work. And that's the secret. When you love what you do, it doesn't really feel like work. And the traditional path is out there for everyone. It is there for you, for you to go down. It is there for you to take. But the thing is, and the thing they don't tell you is, it's not right for everybody. You have to find your own specific path, which leads very nicely into talking about niche markets. Theater folk follows a very teeny tiny niche. Schools, student performers. We only publish plays that are suitable for students. In the world of publishing, that makes us microscopic. And that's on purpose. It's our intention to remain small. We will not expand out of our niche. We have no interest in going into community theater or adult or going down to, uh, you know, down to elementary. It's middle school, high school. That's all we do. There's a couple reasons for that. When you are a general catch-all kind of company, yes, absolutely 100%, you have more customers. You also have more competition. 
There are so many other publishers out there who cast a much wider net of what they publish. And to compete with them is tough. Samuel French is a hundred years old, over a hundred years old. It would take years and years. And even if we wanted to, why try to be the next Samuel French? They already exist. It's already there. Right? Why not try to be something special for a special group of customers? I would rather be special to a small group then struggle to compete within a larger group. And bigger is not really always better. Small also means really flexible. We can make decisions, make changes on a dime. I had a discussion with uh, one of the reps from Samuel French who was uh, complimenting us on our, on our Facebook page. Oh, your Theater Folk Facebook page is so great. We would love to do that. And we're like, well, it's really easy. You know, you just sign up, you make a Facebook page. And they have so many authors, and they have so much red tape, and so much diversity, they cannot figure out how to do something as, what to us seems very simple as make a Facebook page. The same applies if you are an individual artist. If you are an individual artist, if you think of yourself as a playwright, for example, Plain and simple, there are so many other playwrights out there trying to get into the same no small number of theaters. There are a limited number of spots in any given theater season, and on top of that, most of those spots are filled by established playwrights or dead playwrights. Let me tell you, it's really hard to compete with a dead guy. You know? So why do it? Why not be something special? to a specific group of people. When you are thinking about becoming an artist as a career, full time, why not think about what small niche you can explore, you can be the best at, right? Why not be the best at a small thing than be just sort of okay at a big general thing? Niches are really, I think, a viable and accessible avenue for a successful arts career. I love writing in a niche market because it gives me focus to my writing. I know exactly who my audience is. I know exactly who's gonna produce the play. I get asked, you know, don't I get bored writing the same thing over and over again? Well, frankly, it's my job not to get bored. That's my job, right? And so I've sort of boiled it down to there's only three things that I can't write about when it comes to schools and student performers, and that's sex, swearing, and going through a middle age crisis. And I'm really okay. I don't need to write, I, I, don't, uh, I don't even want to think about middle age. Okay, but I don't, I, that's three. There are a gazillion other things that I can write about, and I do. Um, a niche makes it really easy for theater folk to know exactly what kind of play is going in the catalog. We never have to question what's going in. When we get a submission, it is very specific about whether uh, it's going to be a fit for us or not. And that's something else too. If you ever are a playwright and you want to submit somewhere, it's really important you know what the guidelines are, what niche uh, a company is trying to fill because if you try and shove something into the, their company that you think is really great, but it doesn't fit them in any way, you're not really endearing yourself to anybody. So, and most importantly, because we have this, we follow this very one thing, it makes it really easy for our customers to find us. Drama teachers, that's what we want. Teachers tell us time and time again, they do not have to wade through a huge catalog that may or may not have something that's good for them. They know exactly that everything we've got is suitable, and it's just a matter of taste, whether they like it or not. So when we started out, we did not have a clue about this, this whole idea of uh, niche markets or focusing on schools or students. We were just swimming in the stream. And we just happened to uh, live in North Bay, which was, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, a, at the time, pretty much a mecca for high school theater. Who knew? Uh, it was The North Bay was the Canadian hub of uh, an American organization called the Educational Theater Association, an international thespian festival. So there was a huge one-act play festival in the fall for students. There was Sears in the spring. They did a big musical production in the summer. And I spent four years there um, watching a lot of crap, right? Watching really inappropriate script choices, just really, really 
oh, really, really awful, awful, awful place. And I sat there and I thought, well, I, I, can, I can do better than this. I can write something that is fun, that is appropriate, that is challenging. And once we started researching what was available for high schools, it became very clear very quickly that the school market was underserviced. When you start thinking about what niche you might be able to fill, think about what research you can do within your art. What is a space that needs filling? What part of your market is starving that needs uh, someone to jump in and be an expert at it? We fell into schools and students by accident, but made a very conscious decision to stay. And not only that, Theater Folk has grown from a company that sells school-appropriate scripts to a company that is highly focused on promoting arts education. So, like everything, we just sort of fell into sort of uh, by accident in turn becoming into uh, arts education advocates. We were at conferences, and we saw there was often a workshop component, and we thought, oh, well, we should teach as well. You know, that'll be a good marketing for our company. But then we started seeing, oh, oh, teaching is important. Did you know that? Teaching is important. And then we saw the direct result of arts education. And then we thought, we want to promote arts education through our company. What can we do to help drama teachers promote arts education? What can we do to make drama teachers' lives easier? And at Theater Folk, we think that arts education is what makes us more than a bookstore. We're not interested in being a bookstore. Again, they exist. Why would I try and be something that already exists? We are interested in being part of an experience. And whether that experience is teaching a playwriting workshop or offering a free newsletter or handing out a free CD-ROM at a conference, or having educational aspects to our plays, such as um, Shakespeare adaptations, or def exploring different formats and genres that can be tied to curriculum. You know, all of that is there to help drama teachers' lives easier, and we love that. We love being a part of that. And further, I think every student should write a play. Teaching students to write plays and teaching teachers to teach students to write plays is a big part of it's my personal uh, arts education mission. And theater folks, too. For eight years, I taught an online playwriting course, um, which took high school classes from the idea stage to a second draft. I, uh, in 2010, I got an OAC arts and education grant teaching students how to find, create, develop theatrical and sustainable ideas. And we, we just turned that into an online course. And I teach many workshops at conferences and festivals for first-time playwrights, for people who do not believe that they can write a play, and I teach them that they can. And I just think that so much of what drama brings to the table, creative thinking, creative problem solving, team building, um, self-expression, self-confidence, all of that is just wrapped up into playwriting in a wonderful, neat little package. So, what this all sums up to is that I, I, I love what I do. I see the impact of theater in schools. I've been directly impacted by uh, what theater does in schools. And I've seen how even the lightest, the fluffiest, the, the, the most seemingly inconsequential play can change somebody's life. That's pretty stunning realization for a writer, right? that there is writing in the world, my writing, that has that kind of impact. I'm not just writing for myself in a vacuum. And that is really way better than just being one of those all caps playwrights. I love what I do. I love working hard at what I do. I love having a focus, a niche. I love that the impact of my writing is in the school market and is attached to arts education. I love writing and working for teenagers. And given the opportunity, I really wouldn't trade it for some traditional path that I thought I wanted just because somebody else was doing it. So thank you for listening today. And I hope what you've taken away from this is a decision to ask yourself the following. What do I want? 
How can I overcome oh, that fear of failure, that whole notion that fear equals bad? What risk project am I going to take with my art? How do I get off the hamster wheel? How do I not make beige art? How do I take on something that uh, may work or may not? And what am I doing here, right? That's a pretty big question to ask yourself. What am I doing here? What is my purpose? What do I want? Thank you very much.